Hey everyone. Um, we're starting a new section today on mixed integer optimization or just discrete optimization. It's um, five classes left for the semester and so we'll use at least about that many to cover this topic and we'll go as far as we can get with this. This is probably one of the more interesting and exciting topics and extremely practical. As I've been having meetings now with uh, more than half of you I've met already uh, regarding your project, many of you are actually coming up to potentially looking at an integer formulation for your system. Um, I've steered some of you away from that, um, but that is only because there's so, such a short time to do the work and learn the material and do your project. But there's no reason why, as one of your cases, remember, you're presenting two or three cases in your project that you can't extend your existing linear pro problem or your nonlinear problem and take it to an integer formulation. You're going to see how we can do that in today's class. Um, so that, it's, it's really exciting to see integer variables being brought in and you can solve a lot more practical problems with them. Just on the project meetings today, those of you that uh, the last batch of meetings are scheduled for this afternoon um, in my office. So that's not in the tutorial venue. Um, just come to my office, there's 10 minute blocks and it will be very, uh, very quick, short meetings to wrap up the project discussions. The project discussions, by the way, have been going very well. A lot of really good, exciting projects being covered here in the class. So let's come back here to integer variables and there's two references there. If you click on that hyperlink, uh, you'll find the full reference on the course website. Um, I will mention that when we look at this topic, we'll be looking at it in, in three different perspectives. One is how we can set up these problems. What do these variables look like? How do we formulate the problems? And then how do we solve the problems? Now, I'm not going to do them in chunks, right? When you read this in a textbook, they have a whole chapter on describing integer variables and then another whole chapter on solving the problems. I'm going to be intertwining it, introducing problems, showing you solutions, how to solve it, and um, We'll be learning it that way, which is actually, a, a, from an educational perspective, a more effective way of looking at it. So here's the general problem we're solving. We're trying to minimize some function. CT transpose x is our regular linear program. So we've got continuous variables x and coefficients, cost coefficient c. We're going to add an additional part there, potentially. Um, you can have zero values here in D. But if the d's are non-zeros, you're also adding some sort of term for integer variables. So let's take a look at that right away. We've got y representing integer variables. That symbol, curly z, indicates that they're, they're integer. Specifically, they take on values that are 0, 1, 2, 3, and keep going up in integer steps. The x variables are your regular continuous variables. OK, so if you've got no integer variables, y disappears, the d coefficients disappear, this e matrix disappears, then you're left with your regular LP problem. z equals c transpose x, ax equals b, or ax less than or equal, or greater than or equal to b, and x values between some lower and upper bound. Right? So that's your regular LP. So I've, I've mentioned that over here. Now if you bring in your y variables, you have what's called a mixed integer problem. So if you've got x's and y's simultaneously, we call that a mixed integer, so mi, mixed integer. If the x's disappear, we'll see an example of that at the end of the class, if you've got only discrete variables, only by integer variables, 0, 1, 2's, so a disappears, so the c disappears, then we call that a pure ILP, an integer linear problem. Pro pro integer linear program or problem, um, ILPs. So those are very rare where you've just got integer variables. We'll typically have a mix of them. So MILPs is what we're going to be focusing on. Of course, the next acronym there, MINLP, is obvious. It's the extension of what you see up there mathematically, but now you allow those constraints, you allow your objective function potentially to have nonlinear terms in it. MINLPs is a whole problem on itself that we're not going to even focus on. Um, it's not difficult for you to set it up in GAMS and solve it. So for those of you that whose problems for your projects are nonlinear and have integer variables, you can take the GAMS code you're going to see in a minute and just add nonlinear equations, let the solver solve it and do its work. You don't have to really understand what's going on behind there. 
we're not going to try and focus and try and understand that because that's such a large concept to fathom. So let's take a look only at MILPs. Now, there's one way that you can solve it, and I'm going to point this out, is not a very useful way, but it does lead into understanding how we will try to solve these later on. So what you could do is you might be tempted to just take those discrete variables, y, the 0, 1, 2, 3s, and say, well, I'm not going to tell the solver they're discrete. I'm just going to hide that from GAMS and just code them as regular continuous variables. Let GAMS find the optimum, and then I'm just going to round it to the closest integer. Okay. So you might be doing this, for example, where y is the number of trays in the distillation column, and you're going to sol have some objective function to minimize cost or maximize profit. y is the number of trays in your distillation column. GAMS finds the answer is 24.7. You're going to just round it up to 25. Okay. Now, that's not necessarily problematic, but I'm going to point out that it can be problematic in some instances. So, I mean, we've done that before. Here's another example. We looked at the crude oil right at the start of this course, if you remember, we were looking at barrels of crude oil. And a few people in the class mentioned, well, you can't buy half a barrel of oil. Right? So we should actually treat those like an integer variable. But I'm going to come to a subtlety in a minute that will guide you on when you should treat it like that and when you shouldn't. So this example is going to show us when you should not round. Let's take a look at this. We're trying to maximize this function. Here it is, 21x1 plus 11x2. That's my objective. I've got one constraint. Well, actually, I've got three constraints. The first one is here, 7x1 plus 4x2 is less than 13. That's this diagonal line. We've also got two non-negativity constraints. The usual x1 must be positive, x2 must be positive. OK. I'll give you a minute and solve that as a regular LP and tell me where the optimum is. You can do this intuitively. You don't need GAMS. So where is the optimum for that problem? Solving it as a regular LP for x1 and x2. Minimize or maximize? Maximize, yeah. Where's the optimum if you're trying to maximize as a regular LP? At 2 and 0? 1.87, OK. 1.87 for x1 and a value of 0 for x2. Okay, So it's right there in that corner. Remember, for LPs, we simply can just evaluate the vertexes or the vertices we're trying to maximize. So it's either this vertex over here or that vertex over there. right? Sub in values, you can prove that the bottom right corner is higher value than the top left. Yeah. How did you get 1.87? Like so I just know, I know the true value. Oh. Okay, but it's just, it's in that corner. Okay. So it's not the, it's not the top, right, top left corner, it's the bottom right corner. OK, so a quick evaluation of, of the function will give you a value of approximately 39 for that, for that objective function over there. OK, so that's if you try and trick GAMS into thinking this is a regular LP. But it's not. OK, and this next part illustrates why doing that is not a, not a useful way. If you round up, which is what people might do, you're going to say, well, that as an integer will be 2 
this is going to be zero. You evaluate your f of x at those conditions, you get an answer of 42. Okay, what's the problem with that solution? It violates the constraints, so we can say not feasible. Okay, so that, that, that's the problem with rounding up here in that instance. You get a great objective function value, but it's not a feasible solution. If you round down, you're going to round down to 1. x2 is still going to be 0. Is that feasible, rounding down? It's not optimal. You get an objective function value of 21 in this case. Okay. Where's the ILP solution? So if you solve this as a explicitly taking integer variables into account, where's the ILP solution? Take a minute and discuss that with the person next to you. Okay, anyone want to give a give a solution? Where's the where would the ILP solution be? Devin? Sorry? X2 equals 3. Other suggestions for the ILP solution? Okay, 1, 1 has a value of 32. This point over here has a value of 33. So at that location, x1 equals 0, x2 equals 3. Notice they're a very, very different solution to any of the, in the prior options. Okay, and the function value at that location is 33. So what you've learned there, actually, not only that how to solve these as an LP and then and round up or down. But the other thing that you've learned here is how t we can go about solving LPs. You did this probably without even realizing. You just go and evaluate brute force every possible permutation of x1 and x2. In other words, those uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 blue dots, you can simply just go evaluate the function brute force at every combination of x1 and x2. Those blue dots represent the only feasible points in your entire solution space. Points out away from those blue dots are not feasible. So integer variables constrain this feasible region down to these simple points in that two-dimensional space. So that's the key insight. Integer variables bring in a large constraint to reduce the possible search space. And one way to solve MILPs or just ILPs is by brute force enumeration of every possible permutation. Okay. Yes, Mark? Are you saying that that's like a lot of work though? Like it's not the best way to do it because you're just... Well, it wasn't a lot of work. We Just six function evaluations in this case. Yeah. Okay, but you can, you're going to see in the coming classes that what if you had seven or ten integer variables? Now that becomes a combinatorial type problem. Okay, so, but the insight of enumeration of every possibility is exactly how these problems are solved. And we're going to look at the methods coming up shortly. Okay, so this gives you a bit of idea, firstly, how we use these variables. You've got some insight there, and how the problems are solved. But what we haven't really understood is what might we apply integer programming to in chemical engineering, or in engineering in general. So. I'm going to give you five minutes to, to discuss that. And you've got plenty of space here at the bottom of page one as well as on the top of page two to fill in. You should be able to come up with at least 10 different ways in which you might use integer variables. I'll give you a bit of a warm up. The first one is might be that you use it to represent the number of trays 
in a column. And I'll give you another hint or another suggestion. You might even use it as the number of tubes in a shell and tube heat exchanger. Okay, so take that as some inspiration and think of at least eight other ways in which you could use integer variables to solve problems that are relevant to you. What type of problems naturally have integer type representation? Okay, so we saw this in 4N. If you have number of pumps in series, your reliability goes up. So R, your reliability goes up. Sorry, not in series, in parallel. They have to be in parallel. Okay, so you can have zero pumps, one pump in parallel, two pumps in parallel, three pumps in parallel. You can't have 2.5 pumps in parallel. So representing that is a great way for integer variables. Anything else? Matt? Not a mixer in a Number? A Number of mixers in a tank. Anything else? Kilia? It could be like number of membranes or like in series or in parallel. Okay, so number of filters in in series or in parallel. Okay, anything else on a flow sheet? Devin? Which catalyst to use? So you could use catalyst A or B or C or so on, and that's a natu natural integer variable. There's another suggestion there? Uh, number of employees. Number of employees, yeah. So number of people or operators on your plant, Mark? For the catalyst, you could also just do whether or not to use a catalyst. Right, that's a good point. So which catalyst, A, B, or C, or none? Okay, so the zero is a natural representation for no catalyst. One for A, two for B, and so forth. Yeah, Nastasia? Like scheduling purposes, like what piece of equipment can we have? Okay, so we're going to see a lot of scheduling type ideas coming out up here, so which piece of equipment is, should be used at which point in time? Okay, sorry. Yeah, like lots of batch processes. Right, batch reactors are a natural for scheduling. So the food industry does this very frequently. So you've got one batch reactor, but you've got multiple recipes. So which order do you use that reactor in to run your recipes? Right, and then you've got some interesting constraints. So you want to run all your nut-free products first in the reactor, then run your products that use nuts in them afterwards. Then you do your clean. Okay, so how do you order that is going to be interesting coming up. Anything else? A few more creative ideas. Okay, so you might relate to this idea of catalyst. You could also take it further. Do you use a CSTR or a PFR? Okay, do you go into a plug flow reactor or a CSTR? Just to come back uh, to Kalia's point here about units in series or in parallel, related to this idea of CSTRs or PFRs, you could see this on a flow sheet, right? So you come, you've got a material coming in and there's a potential split, there's valves, and then here you've got your CSTR, and then here you've got your PFR. So a natural for integer variables is to put this variable here. Let's just call that D1, delta 1, delta 2. If delta 1 is 0, then you close that valve and you don't use the CSTR. If delta 2 is 1, you open that valve and you use the PFR. So you can have your flow sheet set up in that way with deltas changing signs between 0 and 1 
to indicate valves open or closed. Okay, and I'm going to show you later on what if you want to ensure that you're only using the CSTR or the PFR but not both. How do you code that up in a constraint? Okay. Any, any other ideas? Okay, we're going to see some other chemical engineering type options is imagine you've got a budget and you've got 15 projects to select from and you want to select only the projects that make you the most money. So do you do the project or don't you do the project? There's a binary variable, an integer variable there. Um, let's see which other ones I have. Pumps, when, you, um, when we're looking at pumps, you, you buy pumps and pipes for that matter in discrete sizes. So pipes, let's take pipes as a natural one, 12 inch, 14, 16, 18 inch pipes. Those are integer variables. Now, I don't have it here on the slide, but I want you to think of this, Sudoku. Can you solve that as an integer problem? Right? Yeah, you can see the potential there for Sudoku. So you take your Sudoku grid, all the open squares, you assign them search variables. They're integers, one, two, three, four, up to nine. What are the constraints? Uniqueness within a block of nine, and summing up within the rows or columns must add up into an appropriate number. Okay, so Sudoku can be solved as an integer problem. You can go code that up into GAMS and have GAMS solve the Sudoku problem for you instead. Okay, so it comes up in so many different places. Let's, um, uh, one other final area where this is used a lot is in, in purchasing. Um, so ticket sales, so imagine a, a theater venue, you've got your higher price seats, your lower price seats, and your medium price seats. Or if it's an airplane, you've got first class, business class, and economy. So you can represent those prices in, in discrete amounts with integer variables. So that you maximize the total revenue made in your aircraft, having constraints on the number of business, first class, and economy class seats available. Okay, so. So many optimization problems show up in this way that it's, it's an important idea that we have to go through. Let's um, focus in on these. And what you will have noticed in this discussion we've just had is that we call these discrete variables, integer variables. But there's this idea, and it's not my word, uh, of lumpiness. OK, so it's not very scientific. but. If you take the idea of a rail car, you're deciding to purchase plastic pellets and they come delivered to your site in these large rail cars. You can either buy zero, one, two, three rail cars. The supplier will not ship you a partially filled rail car. So you cannot buy 3.2 rail cars. So you have to and should use integer variables for that. But let's come back now to the barrel of oils example, right? That variable is large. Say, the order of magnitude we were looking at in the pre previous problem was 3,500 barrels of oil. Should you treat x being the number of barrels of oil as an integer variable or as a continuous variable? OK, so in that case, as a few of you are, are, are saying, is barrels of oil could be treated there as a continuous variable and not as an integer variable. You can get away with using it as a continuous variable in GAMS rather than an integer variable because it's not as lumpy as a rail car. Right? A rail car is a big discrete item, but a barrel of oil is small. And if you're buying 3,500 or 3,501, you would round it down, and you're not going to violate your constraints by very much. But a rail car of plastic pellets is a big difference when you round those up or down. So again, your gut feel will often guide you on whether you should represent a search variable as integer or continuous. And the other thing that will guide you is the amount of time it takes. If you represented barrels of oil as integer variables, solving that problem is going to uh, be computationally burdensome. Okay, we'll see why coming up. OK, so let's focus only on the most simple discrete type variable, a 0, 1 binary yes or no variable. And then we'll, um, 
we'll take this a step further. And I'm going to show you several places where you can use this, this idea. The first is, let's say you wanted to add this constraint to your problem. X is either P kilograms of material or nothing. So it's an all or nothing constraint. So DeFasco does this, for example. They're going to put scrap into their smelter to make steel. They either put the whole pile of scrap in or nothing. They're not going to put a half a pile into their smelter. So either you add P kilograms or none at all. Mathematically, for those of you that have studied logic, you'll see this, ups this V shape being used for this. X is 0 or x is equal to p. Okay. So when we write this in integer form, one way we might do that is by using the delta variable. Delta representing either 0 or 1. It's a binary variable. And you say x is equal to delta p. Okay. So when delta is 0, you're not adding any of that kilograms of that material, so then x has a value of 0. If delta is equal to 1, you're adding the full amount of material. Okay. So take this problem now. I'd like you to use that idea and rewrite it as an integer problem over here in the open space using that new piece of knowledge. Okay, suggestions. What changes from the left hand side and the right hand side? This is an easy one. Michelle? Okay. So x3 is replaced with delta p. In this case, p is 20. And wherever x3 appears, you make that replacement. So x3 actually goes out of your problem. So wherever x3 was, you replace that with 20 delta x3 was over here. And this goes away. Okay. So now your search variables are x1, x2, and delta. Okay, and then specify that delta 
is an integer variable. Okay, so that's the complete rewrite of the problem. X3 totally disappears. Delta takes its place as an integer variable. Okay, so the GAMS code that you would then go and use, so this, is, this, uh, this handout is going to be posted on the course website for you to copy and paste from. I've highlighted the parts that are new. Yes, question. So you wouldn't actually write x3 equals delta 20 though, right? You would just have delta as your new. Delta 20 replaces wherever x3 was. So perhaps you might want to write that x3 has become No, x3 doesn't show up in the new problem at all. So as we'll see here in the GAMS code, there's no x3 variable. So copy and paste this. I encourage you to go home and try this. The part that's new here is how do you specify binary variables in GAMS? So I've put it here in bold for you. Binary variable delta. Okay, so in the past you've had things like positive variables or just variable. To tell GAMS that this is a special type of variable, we say binary variable, and give it a comment as well to remind yourself what that represents. The equations are specified in the usual way. There you see your 20 delta showing up, your 20 delta less than or equal to 150. Your upper bounds for x1 and x2 are shown there. And here's the other new part, solve recipe using MIP. So you're telling GAMS that this is a mixed integer problem. Behind the scenes, GAMS will call whichever default solver you've assigned. On the lab computers, that will be conopt. But there's other MIP solvers that could be used. OK, so you can solve that, and you can uh, get, the, get the answer for yourself at home. OK, so we've now used delta there as a 0, 1 variable, as a binary variable. But this next part tells us we can actually go take that variable a step further and use it elsewhere in our problem. We want delta to represent a value of 1 when we're using that material and 0 when we're not using it, so that we might be able to then kick in other constraints. For example, if you're using that material, then delta you'd like delta to be equal to 1. You might then need some other constraints, such as the requirement for a catalyst, or if that material is being used, you need to add extra cooling to the reactor. So you're going to use that delta as an indication to the optimizer that something different has kicked in. If you're coding this in MATLAB, it's no different to you thinking of, thinking of it as of the form, if this, do that, else that. So it's an if-else type tool for GAMS. You can't go write if, if such and such a condition, do this, else do that in GAMS. But you can trick GAMS, if you want to think of it that way, into doing an if-else statement for you by using a binary variable. Okay. So let's take a look at, at how we set this up. I'll give you a conceptual problem to work through and then have you try and understand what's going on here. So we're at this concept where let's say we're taking a certain amount xf of flour it's a baking recipe and there's some upper bound on the amount of flour we're, we can use in our manufacturing facility so we've got a large batch mixer xf is the kilograms of flour and there's an upper bound of 400 kilograms you can't go more than that but what we want is an indication of whether we're using flour or not. Okay, and I've given a, a, a simple example here. If you are using flour, you will then want to kick in an additional requirement that you also need to add baking powder. But you could do anything else with that indication. So mathematically, we represent that indicator as the following. Xf minus m times delta is less than equal to 0. OK, I want you to think of it in these scenarios. Let's start actually with the second, one, second bullet point there. That's the easiest one to consider. So if f xf is non-zero, so even if it's a small amount, 
what does delta's value need to take on for that constraint to be feasible? You've got two answers, two options, sorry. What value must delta be for that constraint to be feasible? Michelle? Needs to be 1. OK, so if xf is some positive number, so sub in, I've given you an example there, a value of 0.1. That constraint is only feasible when delta is equal to 1. If delta is equal to 0, that constraint is violated. If delta is equal to 0, you're, you're writing something like this. 0 0.1 is less than 0, which is obviously not, not correct. Okay, So the only way that that constraint is feasible is when delta is equal to 1. So if you're using flower, delta will switch to a value of 1 in order for you to solve a feasible optimization problem. OK, does, is that clear? A little bit uncertainty? No? OK, let's take this. Now, this is where it might become a little bit more nuanced, is if you're using no flower, so none flower whatsoever, then what values of delta make that constraint feasible. Delta can be 0 or 1. OK, let's, let's try the first one. If delta is equal to 0, we're saying 0 minus 0 is less than or equal to 0. OK, and that's feasible. If we try the second constraint, delta equals 1, we're saying 0 for xf minus, let's just sub in the value there of m400 in this case, must be less than a 0. That's also true. Okay? So what we're seeing here with integer variables is they, they give you a one-sided indication. We can reliably know when we are using flower. When we are using flower, delta is guaranteed to be 1. Okay? But it can be ambiguous if we're not using flower. So if xf, the optimal xf, goes to 0, delta could be either 0 or 1. We're not necessarily sure. Either one of these values of delta can be used, and that constraint is still true. Okay? Now, this isn't a problem as big as a problem as it sounds. This ambiguity here is actually OK. What we're mostly interested in is this condition. When we are using flower, we want to know about it so that we can take some other action. OK? Yes, Michelle? Sorry, which equal part? No, yeah, it's, it's less than or equal to. It's always set less than or equal to. OK, but I see where you're going. We can, we can work around that. OK, so here's why this is not such a big deal. Because take a look at this. Delta, we've got here, delta indicates whether flour is being used in the recipe, even a small amount. We can use that delta indicator somewhere else. Particularly, you can use it in your objective function. Let me write it out this way. You can write your objective function, say minimize f of x, all sorts of components related to cost and so on. And then what is very commonly done is when we're in using an integer variable here for an ingredient, we might have a penalty value of minus 25 delta. Okay, so you're going to penalize the use of flour. Which one of these two values is delta going to go to when you penalize it in that way? Is it going to go to 0? 
1. Zero. Who says zero? Who says one? <laughs> okay, so XF is, is, there's no flower being used. So there's some ambiguity in this constraint. Delta could either be zero or one, and that constraint is still valid. But if you penalize it in your objective function in that way, so you add this additional term, minus 25 times delta. Which way is delta going to go to preferentially? One, OK? It's going to go to one, because that's going to make that constraint more negative. OK? So penalizing it in that way still doesn't resolve the ambiguity for us. But what we can do then is penalize it in the opposite way. You can add it as a plus. So you can add it as, a, as that, and then it will go to the 0, which is more desirable for us. Okay, So we w this is maybe a, um, maybe a little bit of a nuanced concept, but don't worry too much if it's not readily apparent for you. It takes a while to work through it conceptually. But the key I want you to get from this is, at the very least, this part that's up here in the box. When you are using flower, delta will go to 1 and is a reliable indicator of using flower. When you're not using flower, the point I'm trying to make here is that there's potential ambiguity in the value of your integer variable. But that ambiguity can be resolved by adding a penalty term in your objective function. Okay. And this problem comes up occasionally, but it's often taken care of by other constraints. So it's, it, delta will most often go to the, the desirable value. Let's take a look at one final example before we finish up. How much time do we have? We've got a few minutes. This next one shows a very natural use of penalty, sorry, of integer variables. And that's of costs. So I'd like you to consider this case. If you're shipping a product, there's a fixed price for shipping. So $25 is the example here. You're, you're shipping a package, and there's a $25 shipping fee, no matter what. It's the processing fee, the administration fee, whatever you'd like to call it. There's this base amount. Then there's an additional $5 per kilogram of package weight. So draw the function, the cost function, as a function of package weight for that scenario. What does that English terminology turn out to look like geometrically in a function? What does that plot look like? And to give you some guidance, there's two bullet points that you can answer to help you. Just ship, shipping one package, XP. Yeah. XP is a continuous variable. OK, so let's, um, let's emphasize that. XP is continuous. Any suggestions on what that curve looks like? It's a straight line, yeah, with a slope of 5. OK, how far does this line go? All the way to 0. So if you ship a package of half a kilogram, 0.1 kilogram, up to here, if you ship a package of zero kilograms, how much do you pay for shipping? 25? Zero. OK, so if you ship nothing, you should pay nothing. OK, so we can represent this as our cost 
as a function of package weight equals 0 if xp is 0, but it equals 25 plus 5xp if xp is greater than 0. Okay. Do you see the if else happening there? So if your package is zero weight, you pay zero dollars shipping. If your package is a non-zero weight, you pay some fixed amount plus five times XP. Okay, so this is a natural candidate for an if-else type statement, just as we've seen in the step before. So any guesses how you might code this up as an integer variable? or use an integer variable to code, up, code this up so that you don't have this if-else, because you can't do that in GAMS. So introduce a new variable. And what single function could you write there to make that work in GAMS? OK. so. Devin's suggestion is 25 times delta plus 5 times x. You have to bring the delta outside the bracket. Delta outside the bracket? Because if x delta is equal to 0, then you'll still have plus 5 xp. But if you bring delta outside, then it's only Devin? If delta is 0, then xp is 0. OK, so I'm going to leave it there at that point. How do you represent this in GANs? Right, this is part of the fun of integer variables and where people spend a lot of their time is just setting up the problem. So it's good. Try to come to class next time with that in mind. And also, I suggest you read ahead in the rest of the notes on the knapsack problem. Okay, so we'll look at the